Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Wayne Caldwell, and I'm thrilled today to have with me Professor uh, Mark Lapping. And uh, Mark was the first director of the school 40 years ago. How are you, Mark? Very good, thank you. It's great to have you with us today, and we're looking forward to hearing some of your stories. I know right now you are in the esteemed position. I've got Distinguished University Professor Emeritus at, at Southern Maine University. Yes. And uh, so just uh, perhaps if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about your background and how it came that you ended up in Guelph. Hmm. Well, um, I didn't start out as a planner. Uh, in fact, I, I grew very interested in the middle of my doctoral work at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and some problems related to the history of planning. And from there, I migrated into actually uh, studying a little planning at Columbia and getting involved in planning education early on, um, first at Virginia Tech, uh, which was located in Southwest Virginia and Appalachia. And curiously, I found the vast, vast majority of my colleagues interested in urban planning. Mm. And here we were in the midst of Appalachia and uh, not a lot of people interested in the locale and the people and its issues and problems. I, I was and actually did some work for the New River Planning District in Virginia um, and gradually gravitated toward more rural interests. Uh, I was uh, for a number of years at my home state university, the University of Vermont, and uh, because I was close to people in agriculture in particular, mm -hmm. uh, I knew about Guelph and its position as uh, indeed Canada's premier uh, agricultural, veterinary, rural, interested university. Um, and um, uh, I was asked to come to Guelph. It was very exciting for us. I had a young family at the time and the idea of moving to Canada was very attractive to us. Uh, living in Vermont and in upstate New York as well, uh, we thought of nothing crossing the border going to Montreal. I've always been a lifelong Canadians fan, which I can't say too loudly here <laughs> in Maine because it's, it's all Bruins. Um, it and I've always been interested in Canadian issues, uh, just as part of my intellectual interests. It's really interesting that that before you're arriving in Guelph, that focus on rural, because I observe it too. How easy it is for for planning schools, for example, to become dominated by urban issues, and we forget the millions, and in the case of the U.S., the tens of millions of people that live in rural communities. Oh, well, absolutely. We're still. Um, I've done a couple of pieces of writing for the American Planning Association and always go out of my way to indicate uh, that a very substantial part of the American population is rural, deep rural as well as urban rural fringe and everything in between. And that many of the roots of American planning issues um, and theories actually have their uh, origin in uh, thinking about rural regions. Mm -hmm. uh, on international, of course, uh, the world is still predominantly rural. And um, uh, if we don't, if, if we don't solve some of the issues of rural areas, we'll never get close to solving the problems of the vast growing urban uh, regions of the world, and cities that are 16 million, 18 million, mm -hmm. 33 million, so forth. Absolutely true. And I can see how that background would have served you so well as, uh, as I don't know, did you apply for the position at Guelph or did you get a call out of the blue or how did that? I think I got out? a call, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and was asked to apply. And I did so and uh, was thrilled to um, meet the search committee. Uh, the search committee, indeed, many of its members ended up being the school's advisory committee. Uh, people like uh, Fred Doms in geography and Rick Richards, who uh, was sort of the dean of rural and agricultural things and um, policies in Canada, and, and a number of other extraordinary people who ended up supporting the school. I, I can only imagine, it must have felt like an incredible adventure. 
Like you're, it, it was. Setting out. It was. I mean, to be, I think I was 33 at the time, and the opportunity to start something uh, new um, was was a bit scary, but very attractive as well. Um, the Guelph experience and doing something new, though with an awful lot of support because there was so much happening, I, I had a chance to duplicate that again uh, many years later when I founded the uh, Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I could have done that without the Guelph experience and the deanship of the College of Architecture, Planning and Design at Kansas State University, which, which happened in between. Mm. I, I, I can imagine you arrive in Guelph and uh, I mean, I, I had, had, was there a template laid out for you as to what was wanted or was this completely in your purview to design? Oh no, I think um, it, I would never call it a tabula rasa mm. in the sense that there was so much already there. First, uh, there was the RDOP, the Rural Development Outreach Program. Uh, terrific people. Uh, Tony Fuller, uh, Jackie Wolf, um, uh, Val Gilmore, John Fitzsimons, uh, people who were all doing really significant work, both in the North, among the Anishinaabe peoples, mm -hmm and um, in places like Huron County, uh, doing work um, uh, on the rural elderly. So that was already there. And likewise, uh, there was a Center for Resource Development, I think it was, headed by Stephen Rod. And Barry Smith was there and a number of other, uh, Alan Joseph, uh, uh, who was in geography. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the things that I learned in the United States, the formative, uh, forgive me, that's my phone, but I'm in a place where it's just gonna happen. Um, in the United States, I think one of the formative uh, post-liberal uh, origins of the social sciences and still remains dominant in policy studies is economics. When I got to Canada and participated later more fully in Commonwealth universities, I learned it was geography. Mm. And that was such a different perspective for me. I have a postdoc uh, from MIT in regional economics in public policy and thought that was the uh, entreeway. Well, in Canada, it really wasn't, I think with the great British tradition, it was geography. And it was a whole different way to view uh, information issues, data, uh, so forth. Hmm, interesting. It's, it's interesting in, in speaking to a few other folks about your early days. The one comment that I uh, that stuck with me was uh, the effort that you put into getting out into community and meeting with people and coming to understand the issues that existed in Ontario. And that must have been part of the adventure and part of the challenge as well. Absolutely. Um, I think too many, it's been my experience uh, that too few Americans see Canada as a very distinctive and in fact, very different place. Um, different people, different history and traditions. I'd have to say in all candor, when we, were de when we determined to leave Guelph and we headed to Kansas, it was in part because Joyce and I came to understand that Canada was a profoundly different culture, profoundly different country where the regions are so vast and diverse. And we came to realize the more we were in Canada, the more we were American. Hmm. Um, and um, uh, getting the chance to travel, meet people, getting around, that, that went into that and that was reinforced. Uh, interestingly enough, my kids ended up paying for it because when they went to uh, school in the States, uh, uh, they spelled labor, L-A-B-O-U-R. Um, 
And they also had in the Ontario schools, the new math. Well, this was totally different in the States. We weren't there yet. My kids understood metrics. No one understood metrics in the United States. So the first year or so in school for both of my kids, um, they had some struggles. <laughs> That's a fantastic story. Yeah. Well, a, a couple of men, moments ago, you mentioned some of the folks that were around uh, some of the deans, uh, Tony Fuller yep. and Jackie Wolf, who will have spoken to as part of this uh, this process. And and uh, so as you arrived, just I mean, just maybe just your initial reaction to the facilities, the school, uh, what was there, what wasn't there, what you were lacking. Yeah. Um, I probably should say at the very outset. Um, Don Foster, who was the president at the time, and especially Howard Clark, uh, mm -hmm. who was the vice chancellor, the provost, they were just marvelous in their support of doing this. And I think naming the school the university school sent a message that the entire university was to participate in the creation of the school. And that sent a very powerful message. So having the two leaders of the university um, participate in the school uh, was, I think, of monumental consequence and importance. When I got there, there was a secretary who I'll talk about in a minute, mm -hmm. and a Selectric, IBM Selectric typewriter uh, and an office and a sort of cavernous big room that ultimately became uh, the school's habitat. Um, uh, Vi was the secretary and she worked for the president. And um, as, as Don Foster said, she know, Vi knows everybody in the university, so she'll be able to direct you very well. But I, everyone else facilitated my grounding, mm -hmm. and that's very important. Uh, almost before uh, I unpacked, uh, Tony got me to a, an, a very important conference in Sweden. Uh, George mm -hmm. Brinkman went with us, Tony and myself, and out of that came lifelong associations with some Swedish planners. Um, and I think Tony took me around. Uh, Gary Davidson, who at that time was head of uh, planning department at, at Huron County, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Alex Mikelos, who ended up leaving Guelph, and I think he became president of Northern British Columbia University. He was just, you know, all of these people facilitated my grounding in, in the region uh, and in Ontario in particular. So I was very, very fortunate. Uh, by no means was this a tabula rasa. No mm. means was it Mark's idea. Mm. This, was, this was a really comprehensive, broad-based commitment that the university made and, and colleagues made for us. That's a fantastic overview and background of things. I, I'm assuming one of your first tasks was to think through what, do you, what did you need to do in terms of faculty hires? Right. Um, uh, certainly that was the case. Um, I knew what would be best was to have a core of full-time committed faculty and then a number of other faculty from throughout the university who would participate in our programs. And um, I think without a doubt, the most strategically important hire was George Penfold. I think there was some pressure that we ought to hire a PhD qualified academic planner. Uh, George had a master's, I think, in agricultural engineering, um, was for many years associated with Gary Davidson in Huron County, and I think in many ways was one of the premier practicing rural planners in the province. The hiring of George, I think, sent a very important message to the planning community in Ontario and throughout Canada 
that we were serious about being a planning school, that we were going to be on the ground and doing the important work of planning and community development. Um, and um, that was, I think, the most strategic hire. And, and George certainly during those years proved his brilliance, his, his worth over and over and over, a real workhorse. I also knew that um, given Canada's role in the Commonwealth, uh, which still is a very important value uh, in Canadian life and academic life, and the kinds of issues that Guelph as a university community was involved in, particularly in developing countries, um, that, that an international approach was also important. And that's where the idea came from, Wayne, of having essentially two streams, mm -hmm. one that would attract students who are interested in international work in rural development, and another stream which would speak directly to the needs of Canadian communities and particularly in Ontario, uh, but, but throughout the country. Uh, so that was established pretty, pretty early. I think the advisory committee that I had certainly supported that notion. And I think it was frankly embedded in the very uh, fiber of the University of Guelph. And I like that very much. That led to hiring Harry Cummings. And then I think too, we understood that when you're dealing with rural and the background that the, uh, the Center for Resource Development established for, for the school in a sense, that having someone very, very strong uh, in resources and environment and that was John Fitzgibbon. Mm. And along with John, the other benefit was his wife, who participated with us in a number of things and offered courses. That was a twofer. And uh, it was wonderful. And then, of course, there was Tony, there was Jackie, there was John Fitzsimons, uh, there were other people as well. And um, all of those hires were important. But we, we were very, very fortunate in the willingness of people in other faculties, uh, particularly social sciences, but also in human ecology, for example, uh, Anne Martin, um, uh, who worked extensively with the elderly and elderly issues. Uh, Anne Martin Matthews, forgive me, um, was, uh, was incredibly helpful. And I think that was facilitated uh, by the RDOP, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, did such important work in Wellington and so many other um, uh, counties and townships. It's interesting as you go over that because it, it, it reinforces for me what I understand to be so core to the school, which is this broad definition of planning. And I can look at planning schools elsewhere that, you know, they get focused on land use. And in some cases, that's appropriate. But I think in the rural context, how the foundation that was set back then has been so critical in terms of helping us to understand that planning is so much more than, than just that. Yeah, I think there's, there, of course, is a strong tradition of physical planning. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I really learned that when I left Guelph and became dean at Kansas State, uh, one of America's great land grants. Um, we were in the planning program. Uh, well, I wanted to try to duplicate in Kansas what we attempted to do with, I think, some real success at Guelph. Uh, there was Vern Dynas at Kansas State my very close friend who just passed, mm. um, uh, uh, John, um, and um, other people, uh, Tom Daniels, who still is a very close friend, who's at Penn, and a couple of other people um, who, who were there. And I felt at Kansas that opportunity was created or existed to create another strong focal point for rural planning. But I, I, I soon learned that because of the strength of, of the landscape architecture program, and especially the architecture program, 
uh, that a strong design focus reinforce the physical planning aspect, the urban design aspect. Um, and at Rutgers, when we founded the Blaustein School, we were really a social science, a very broad-based social science, public policy college. Um, and those two streams, the physical planning and then the social science, still remain in many planning schools. And they, they help craft the vision of that school. Well, I think ours was uh, um, landscape architecture, which proved a very good partner in a number of projects. Uh, and now, of course, the two are together mm -hmm. um, was most helpful and very, very supportive. But we were more oriented, I think, to this broader than design orientation. Uh, and I think that's in part because the most important, I think, quality that a good planner has is to be a good listener mm -hmm. and to really listen and embed oneself at all possible in the community and to try to figure out what was what was really core to the problems and aspirations of rural people in rural communities and i think our dop especially helped ground us in that reality of learning to listen. And George uh, epitomized that. I also have to say that I think with the addition of George in the school as really the first uh, faculty uh, that we hired, it became much easier for us within a year and a half to gain full accreditation from the Canadian Institute of Planners, which uh, it was very important in terms of credentializing our students, that they could fully participate with you know, other planning schools like Toronto, uh, like Queens, um, uh, and, and others within the province. Um, and they were, I think, seen as, uh, as the equal to other CIP programs, but with this special orientation uh, to rural places and rural people. Mm. Do you, do you have, just mentioning uh, students in the early days, do you have any recollections of the student body from those early days? I have a lot. Um, and a couple were, were Americans who came up when word got out. And one um, who I still remain close to is Glenn Hoagland. Uh, who came out of the geography department at the State University of New York at New Paltz, the program I graduated from. And Glenn uh, now works um, extensively in the nonprofit sector and is very important. Uh, Jeff Port, for example, another American, who I think is still in Northern Ontario working as a planner. He is indeed, yes. And, and a number of others. Um, but I think uh, the first group of our students were risk takers, um, really interested in working and living in places other than Downsview, if you will, or um, you know, or Central City. Um, and really, a number of them came from rural backgrounds. Uh, I remember uh, some of them very, very well. Who one who's working still in New Brunswick and a couple here and a couple of there, as well as several international students. Um, they were a risk-taking, active, uh, very, very committed group of students. Yeah, for me, it's uh, now, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, and I suppose it, looking back to the 40 years behind us, the alumni base that's out there now, and you'll take, uh, I'm sure, great interest in, in knowing in not only the students you worked with, but the legacy of that, those initial years is, is, the, is the cohort of students over the last 40 years now. Mm. Yeah, I, I remember coming up for the 25th anniversary and uh, there was quite a few students um, I, I have a very, very special fondness for Marge Mysick, 
who ended up doing work in PE on, I think her major paper on PEI. And I've been working on and off in PEI for the last 40 years. And uh, she was really doing some very important work in planning uh, in the province. And I think that that helps sustain my own interest uh, in issues in the province. Uh, but uh, Linda Craig, um, uh, uh, Mary Coyle, for example, who I believe is a senator from yeah. Nova Scotia, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there were some really wonderful students. Uh, another was uh, um, uh, Rajinda Jutla, um, who um, um, got his master's with us, and then I, a doctorate, and has been a longtime friend and he teaches planning and I think runs the undergraduate planning program at Missouri State University. And uh, he and Vashti have been friends of my family, our family for a long time. I should say too that um, uh, one of the things that helped immensely, at least for me, I won a senior traveling fellowship with the Association of Commonwealth Universities. And it got me to India and uh, to New Zealand, particularly to meet people at uh, Massey University, which had a very strong rural inter uh, interest. Uh, I went to Rajasthan and uh, Delhi School of Economics and um, a number of other institutions. And I really saw, first of all, I understood that Canada meant an awful lot to these Commonwealth institutions. Number two, I was absolutely amazed at the number of people who came out of the woodwork and said, OVC, 43, OAC, you know, the word got out that mm -hmm. someone from Guelph was in India. And it was amazing how many OVC and OAC alum who were working there. Um, and, and that is, and then the international thing absolutely broadened me. And I'd like to think it had a role in my daughter's life. Uh, Karen um, got her PhD at Tufts in nutrition and for 10 years or so was the senior director of nutrition for Save the Children and lived all over the world um, in difficult places. And now she uh, does much of the same thing for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I think um, uh, Joyce and I and the kids traveled a great deal. That was sort of expected at Guelph, mm -hmm. that you have this international uh, perspective and orientation. A number of our students uh, were attracted to CUSO, for example. And um, there, there really was this, this emphasis. Likewise, uh, as one traveled through Canada, one understood, I think, that issues of the North, issues of Indigenous people uh, were front and central, and of course remain so to this very, very day, as one can see with um, uh, some of the issues surrounding uh, the boarding schools for Indigenous children and what needs to happen in terms of reconciliation with indigenous people. I'm always amazed when one looks at the um, webpage of a Canadian university, it almost invariably the first thing on the land of this, of this tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, no one acknowledges that in the United States. Um, and yet that was, that's, that's the case. Mm -hmm. All of us are on the land of indigenous people. Yeah, that's a very fair comment, and it's it's something I reflect that uh, within the school and within the program, our attempts to deal with that. Uh, Professor Sherry Longboat, for example, offers two courses in, in Indigenous uh, planning and Indigenous community issues, which is a step in the right direction, and hopefully oh, absolutely. more to come, for sure. When I was there, uh, we were very, <laughs> I, I felt very, very fortunate in that um, Chief Justice Berger of mm -hmm. the BC Court uh, was doing his work. Uh, it was sometime after the McKenzie pipeline issue. And later I ended up working um, on, the, on, on the Alaska Native Claims Commission 
uh, doing some work of a comparative nature. None of that would have happened for me, none of that exposure, if it weren't for Guelph and people like Jackie and Harry and Tony, um, le not only legitimatizing that, but saying this is important stuff. Mm, indeed. I, ne I will never forget, forgive me, Wayne. No, I will never forget a comment that someone made to me and who said, if native people knew the word the the town of Guelph, they probably knew it first for its correction institution and not the university. Huh. And that really that has stayed with me for a long, long time. And I think the I think the school went the distance in changing that perception. It, it, uh, it's an ongoing challenge to, uh, yeah. to work in that, that field for sure, uh, yeah. and, and hopefully we'll continue to make good progress. Uh, it brings me to this point of looking back now over 40 years. I know we've touched base on the early days of the school, and certainly if there's more you want to offer there, please do so. But if we reflect back on the 40 years, what do you think the program the school has meant? Well, I think, I think in a very real sense, it pushed rural issues into the front of the planning profession. They were always there. I mean, you know, issues of the, uh, the lack of social and healthcare infrastructure in Northern Canada, um, you know, resource development issues. Um, to some extent, I think the school legitimatized that within the planning profession. And one of my great frustrations here in the States is that that hasn't happened uh, in the academic planning committee community that much. I'm one of the people the American Planning Association asked to write on a rural problem or a rural issue. And I've always got to point out that the least supported people, the least well-educated, the poorest, the least well-educated, the least well provided with healthcare services, the people with the fewest options in employment are rural people uh, in every single region in the United States. Mm -hmm. Likewise, rural America is incredibly diverse. And people think the only diversity in the country is in the major cities of the United States. It just isn't so. So I remain frustrated uh, in being um, someone sort of, you know, in a quote unquote backwater, where in Canada, I think one of the legacies of the school is that rural hasn't been allowed to be a, a backwater, if mm. you will. Um, and I think certainly in the short time I was there, uh, whenever I would go to Ottawa, um, and I stayed at a wonderful little hotel in, in, uh, in Hull, um, where I got to practice a little of my French. But whenever I would go to uh, Ottawa, there were people all over the ministries uh, doing stuff. And someone who was at Guelph for a period of time and ended up at uh, Ag Canada, uh, he he Heather Clemenson, was important in the school's uh, 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 birthing, if you will, and development. And she and any number of people um, uh, in the ministries were certainly open to the, to the school. And we reciprocated by, by working with them. And we had great entree, too, because of Rick Richards who was just, just the sweetest, most supportive person I could have uh, ever met in my time at Guelph, right up there with, with Howard Clark and, and Don Foster. And I was um, saddened first when Don left Guelph for Toronto and then saddened even more when he passed away mm -hmm. so quickly. I, I, I named the new school at Rutgers um, after the great president of Rutgers, who passed away a week before I got there. But he brought Rutgers in the private schools uh, and Ivies to become the State University of New Jersey. And um, in a sense, there was some kinship between Don Foster and, um, um, 
Ed Blaustein. If, if we think backwards, but also think forwards for the next 40, 40 years, what do you think the, the challenges are for, for rural, for, for planning in, in general? Well, I think <clears throat> I've thought about that in the context also of, of Rutgers and my ex experience here at the University of Southern Maine. Uh, and that is, um, how should I put this? Um, too many planning programs in my estimate want to be PhD granting programs. And they forget that the meat and potatoes, if you will, of a good planning school resides in its master's program and educating, training, and nurturing planners who are going to work. Um, and this will sound like a criticism, and it probably is, but given the reward systems in North American universities, publication is still the all and be all, and my sense is getting worse. Um, and therefore, the people who really do it, who end up, I think, doing the most in terms of really nurturing a, nu a, a new generation of planners, um, sometimes they get lost. Um, and and that, that worries me. I, I think we probably have more than enough doctoral programs and in planning, and I support them, um, but we don't have, particularly in those programs where they do offer a doctorate as well as the master's, that uh, not enough of the energy is devoted to the master's degree as opposed to the doctorate degree. And um, um, now one sees that there's an awakening to this in American um, higher education in the sense that more and more people are being hired as professors of practice. These are non-tenure bearing positions and they're usually five-year contracts that are renewable. Well, what they're saying is that we need people who are going to be of practice and who will teach what's appropriate in practice. And I don't mean that it's totally workmanlike and you know, just like getting one's accreditation or licensing as a plumber, uh, far from that. Uh, planning is at base, a profoundly intellectually rigorous and demanding field. But I hope Guelph will retain its strong orientation within the school to the master's degree programs, while at the same time supporting the doctoral program in rural studies mm -hmm. that the university has. Um, and it, it may be helpful that, that join to a very professional program like landscape architecture might help maintain that emphasis on, on training and educating and nurturing for actual practice. The world needs more planners, not fewer. Mm. And I think the next 40 years, if the school can keep its eye on yes, helping out and participating fully and richly in the PhD program. But as I said, the meat and potatoes is gonna remain, I hope the master's program. I think those are very insightful. They take, take me back to some of the earlier words around outreach and community-based projects and working and learning within community and how valuable that is and how that can be facilitated at the master's level, which I think is of great value. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, to do projects with students in a community, I, I think in the States, we're sort of lucky in that that we had the whole group of universities that got started out of the land grant tradition uh, and the law Lincoln was finally able to pass in 1864, the Morrill Act and Justin Morrill was a Vermonter and the Ag School is still in Morrill Hall. Well, that sort of said, we're going to create a whole set of institutions 
where teaching, research, and outreach are equally important. And I think without mandating that, that's what the school had and still has. And I'd love to see that maintained, that there's going to be these uh, um, uh, three intimately related, organically related uh, areas of emphasis, teaching, research, and outreach into the community. Indeed, it's my community work which informs my scholarship. Uh, I don't sit here in my den um, dreaming up stuff. It really comes out of problems that I encounter every single day and Maine such a vastly interesting state and a very poor state mm -hmm. and the most rural state along with North Dakota in the United States. Almost all of our case studies are in small communities and in heavily resource dependent communities and indigenous communities. If, if you were to reflect on uh, a message to give to incoming students, whether they be in, into our program or perhaps a program in the US, uh, what would that message be? Be curious. Um, I've, some of the very best planners I have ever worked with were English literature majors. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is a better um, background for planning than any other. Sure, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a geographer and you get GIS kind of early, that's a benefit. But I think planners are curious. And I think the best planners I know have connecting mentalities. And what I mean by that is they see the relationship between biological and physical and social and economics. And they don't know how to divide them because ultimately they can't be divided um, and they shouldn't be. So I think be curious, having a connecting mentality um, and, um, and persevering. Um, this has been a profession though I've spent mo most of it, uh, almost all of it in fact, in academic life. I've always been involved in con consulting and applied research. And I've had a very rich, rewarding uh, life. Um, I, you know, and I still, I'm 74. I'm still learning. Uh, I'm still going and doing. And um, I think, you know, just remaining curious and recognizing that connecting things up is really the way to go. Hmm. That's a great lead into my uh, sort of wrap up discussion question, which is what are you doing now? And you've already mentioned that you're still quite busy doing things. I'm sure former students will be really keen to uh, hear what you're up to. Well, um, over the last several years, and I think maybe because of the influence of my daughter, I've been very, in I've gotten very interested in food planning. And I think I introduced one of the first food planning and policy courses um, in a planning program uh, in the States. And uh, I founded the main food strategy. Uh, I should probably start by saying that one of every five children in Maine lives in a food insecure household. This is a state that is very, very poor. And we have a lot of problems. So I got very interested because of my daughter's work internationally in nutrition and breastfeeding and all sorts of important matters. Um, it's rubbed off on me and I founded the main food strategy and I continue to do some work on, on food. Um, just a couple of years ago, I went to Guelph, I, I'm sorry, I went to Charlottetown uh, to lecture a group on on looking at a food program and policy uh, for the island for the province and um, now food planning is a, a central part of almost all planning curricula and that's what I enjoy doing very much um, I work you know everything from food banks to organic farmers 
to processors to truckers. Uh, it's amazing, but Maine depends 94% of our food comes into the state from on trucks. And as we're seeing now with the uh, uh, the supply chain issues, um, there are holes on the shelves in our supermarkets. Mm. And this is also a state with, because it's the most rural state in the country, um, where food insecurity has a particular rural um, sort of orientation. Uh, one, you know, come winter time, it's tough to get to a food pantry if okay. there is even one. So I've been doing a lot of work on food work. And in fact, I'm just um, doing a review for a journal of several books on, on food, uh, uh, food issues and uh, the lack of access to food among college students, hmm. a big issue. And um, uh, so that's what I've been doing. I've also been um, reading a lot a lot of history these days and my my reading um is very very diverse um but it all i think helps helps me stay active and alive and um though my grandchildren live in california um before the pandemic we used to go out and see them as much as we could and uh, coming up is the american thanksgiving and everybody's coming to Maine, <laughs> which is going to be great. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, a lot of stuff. I do a lot of voluntary, uh, volunteering and, and stuff like that. And um, stay active uh, as much as I can in the planning profession. The, 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 words Maine, life, the, the words lifelong learning really come to mind as I'm listening to you and the things that you're continuing to do. It's quite impressive. If there was anything you'd like to say to former students, uh, Mark, what would that be? Oh, I'm proud of them. I'd like, you know, I am mlapping at maine.edu. I'd love to hear from them and what they're doing and what their experiences have had. And I know um, uh, I've been in touch with Jackie recently, and that's been wonderful to learn all about her incredible work in Australia. And um, I'd love to hear from folks. Uh, I haven't been in touch with George for a while, but I know when he moved to P uh, BC, he was doing important work as well in community development. Um, and I just say, you know, carry on. Guelph is a wonderful place. In many ways, I count my time at Guelph as having been in, at the, the, the best university I've ever been been attached to. I'm not sure I appreciated it that much uh, there, and it ranks right, right up. I came here um, uh, after, uh, after Rutgers. I, I wanted a more Catholic view of universities, and so I came here as provost, and I did that for six years, and then I, I fell ill, and mm -hmm. then once I got a transplant, a kidney transplant, I had to do it again because we were in crisis, um, and then after that, I taught all, all during that period. Uh, I became executive director of the Muskie School of Public Service, which has the same kind of outreach and orientation uh, as the school has. So I'm proud of all of them. I'd love to hear from anybody uh, and reconnect. And um, I have to say, I'm very, very proud of what we did in those years. And it was highly collaborative, um, a little crazy, um, uh, just but just a wonderful experience. And I hope uh, people in in Canada and throughout the world, where Guelph has been represented in Sulawesi and other places, uh, appreciate what the school does. Thank you for that. Anything else you'd like to offer, Mark? Nope. Well, I just want to say enough, I'm still a Montreal <laughs> Canadiens fan. Uh, <laughs> would have been exciting for you last spring but uh yeah <laughs> it was yeah. a surprise yeah I'm very well, excited. i i, I just my, want to, sorry go my, ahead no my son hans 
uh, who's an attorney in Northern California in the Bay Area, um, may be, uh, well, he's a, a, a mammoth shark fan, as well as our grandsons, but uh, may be one of the few people who still uh, roots for the Habs uh, in San Francisco. Well, thank you. Thank you. I just, and for so many ways, thank you for your time today. And uh, more than that, it's, it's on behalf of, of the, the, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of alumni that we have and faculty, thank you for your legacy and the leadership you provided in those early years, because I can tell you so much of what you established back then is still with us today. And we continue to work to build on that as best as we can, but uh, it's that initial leadership and vision that you brought to the table. And I'm hearing the collaborative framework within which that happened, but uh, it's a big thanks to you for all of that work. Thank you, Wayne. Appreciate it. You take care and all the best. You take care too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.